This is HealthWise Alternatives with Jackie Bell, promoting good health through information and education. Hi, welcome to HealthWise Alternatives. I'm your host, Jackie Bell. Today we have with us again Dr. Christine Soley, who is a holistic cardiologist on Cape Cod. Welcome, Dr. Soley. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming back. A little background on Dr. Christine Soley. She has been in private practice for the past 25 years. She's been practicing holistic cardiology and medicine, and it's very important to note that her practice is grounded on building a strong doctor-patient relationship which is a bit unusual nowadays. <laughs> Dr. Soli is board certified in cardiology, internal medicine, and holistic medicine, and is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology. She is the director of the Holistic Cardiology Learning Center of Cape Cod in Yarmouth Port, Massachusetts. Dr. Soli. <laughs> Today we are going to be talking about what is wrong with American <laughs> medical care? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just hand it over to you <laughs> because my mouth is full of too much to say. Well, I think probably you and everybody else. Um, it isn't just medicine that's bad nowadays. I mean, the finances are bad. You know, the pharmaceutical industry is terrible. The FDA is awful. I mean, you read the newspaper and, and things, are, things are bad. But medicine is more worrisome because it has to do with your health and your life. Right. And medical care in this country, which people would probably tend to believe is, is the best in the world, in fact is not. What we have is very good, you know, propaganda, but the World Health Organization evaluates the health in every single country every year and ranks the countries. The um, Japan is consistently number one, the healthiest, longest lived people. Um, and the United States is at the bottom of industrialized countries. The only countries really that have worse health care than we have are third world countries. Wow. And this is a little scary in view of. It is of scary. I mean, we have to agree that as far as emergency medical care, yeah. we're great. But as far as chronic disease care, yeah. We, at this point, with all the money we spend and yeah. pour into and educate ourselves about, um, we would have to say that why isn't heart disease cured? Yeah. Why isn't cancer cured? Yeah. Right? Well, we do. We spend at least twice as much as any other country uh, in terms of health care for, for the people in the United States, and yet we have terrible care. And it's exactly as you say. We do acute care quite well. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, all the modern techniques, we have procedures, we have drugs, and you know, quite frankly, there's no place you'd rather be than the United States if you have a heart attack or if you get run over by a Mack truck. Or, um, for acute care, we're really very good. The problem is that we t try to use the same techniques that we use for acute care with chronic care, and it doesn't work. Right. Because when, when you look at how we are trained in medical school, um, you come to appreciate the, why, we have a, why we have a problem. In medical school, it's a very disease-oriented business. And essentially, in medical school, we are taught how to reach a diagnosis of a disease, you know, what studies to order. Once we have the diagnosis, and the diagnosis is, is prime, that's the whole goal. Once you have the diagnosis, then it's very clear you know what drugs and procedures you can use. And like I said, for acute care, medicine, it works very well. And of course, for somebody having a heart attack, you want to focus on what's happening right now. You don't necessarily want to focus on what was their lifestyle like or, um, you know, what are their risk factors. You want to focus on what's happening and you want to treat it. But in medical school, back in our first and second years, we have our preclinical training. And we have anatomy, and we have physiology, and we have biochemistry. Well, anatomy doesn't much change. The bones are still in the same place. And probably in a physiology and biochemistry don't change a lot, although new information is always added. The problem is, is that we learned uh, physiology and biochemistry, but nobody ever tied it in to clinical medicine for us. And so what we did was we memorized it for the exam and promptly forgot it. 
And that's a problem because essentially biochemistry and physiology tells us how does our body function? Right. You know, how do we get nutrients into our body? How are they absorbed? How are they activated? Where do they work? Um, and when we look at chronic disease, we realize that chronic disease only develops when we're not able to heal ourselves anymore. That, okay, acute care, we're not going to be able to heal ourselves. You know, if you Mack truck runs over you and your bones are sticking out through your skin and you're bleeding to death, you're not going to be able to heal yourself. You're going to have to have somebody, you know, put the bones back in place and put them in a cast and right. press on the artery and sew it up and make you stop bleeding. But in the end, you still do heal yourself. You're the one that makes the new bone. And you're the one who makes the new artery. So acute care medicine buys you time to heal yourself. With chronic medicine, though, it's clear that we're not healing ourselves. And the problem with the way medicine is practiced is that we have absolutely forgotten what we learned in biochemistry and physiology. That, you know, we learned Krebs cycles and we learned glucose 6-phosphate shunts and, and all the pathways, but we've never thought about them since. Well, now what we realize is that if we want to deal with chronic disease, we've got to go back to why is your body not healing? I mean, you have genetic material mm -hmm. that is, a, you know, an architect for, for your cells. It's like an architect's plan. And it tells the cell exactly how it's supposed to be made and how it's supposed to function. And so if you, let's say you cut yourself, okay? That cut will heal whether you put a bandage on or you don't put a bandage on. Even if you pick off the scab, it will heal because your genetic code tells your cell how to heal. Well, we have that genetics in us that tell us how to heal. So why don't we? Right. I mean, why do we not heal? Well, then this comes back to what we didn't learn in medical school, mainly nutrition and an and emphasis on the biochemistry and the physiology. That if you want to deal in, uh, with chronic disease and you want patients to be able to heal, you've got to create it so their bodies can. And so this is why we have what's called functional medicine. And fortunately, functional medicine is becoming more uh, commonplace, not by any means common. In Europe, it's very, in they, Europe, it's they very, talk about it as yeah. functional medicine. Here in the United Here States. Here you, you can hear. get it. Um, there are courses, you can learn it. Um, but physicians are really not tuned into it because <laughs> physicians tend to think that what they learned was true and is not going to change. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate because you know, 75% of what we learn as facts in medicine subsequently change or are outright wrong. So we shouldn't get too wedded to knowing it all. Mm. And we also shouldn't be too dogmatic about what we tell patients. I always say if patients knew that on any trip to the doctor's office there's a 75% chance the advice was not right, that <laughs> the physician should be a little more humble and, and patients should be a little more suspect. Mm. But why why do we not why do we not know how to guide patients well partly we didn't learn it but also it was never emphasized so if you want to figure out how to handle chronic disease you need to look to see do patients take in the nutrients that they need i mean you need to have some perception of what nutrients do we need now since we never did learn that in medical school that would be tough <laughs> but even if we knew that the diet was nutritious we don't know whether we actually absorb it. Mm -hmm. So we need to know that you take in the nutrients, that they're absorbed. If they're absorbed, can you activate them? Most of the nutrients we take in are not in the active form. We have to be able to activate them. So if we can't activate them, it won't matter whether you take them in or not. So if you activate them, can they then work at the receptors? And obviously, disease can occur at any point along a continuum. So in terms of practicing medicine, it's not just a matter of coming up with a diagnosis. You've waited too long if you wait for that. What you want to see is what happens, um, how can you evaluate the steps along the way? And I say that this is most exemplified by what happens if you go to a doctor before you have frank disease, before you have a diagnosable disease, before the cells are so badly damaged that the test will be abnormal. Suppose you go into the doctor with a symptom. 
the physician will listen for long enough to figure out a prescription to write to get rid of the symptom. Mm -hmm. And because the amount of time that you get to spend with the physician is not adequate now, the physician will listen long enough to figure out what tests to order. Now, how did we get to this point of a six-minute doctor visit? Because right. it wasn't always that way. Right. You know, when I, when I was growing up, um, you didn't even have an appointment. You weren't given a time when you called to go see the doctor. You didn't call. You just went to the waiting room. Nobody would be arrogant enough then to tell you how much time your problem was allotted, because how would the receptionist know? Do you need five minutes? Do you need 10 minutes? Do you need an hour? Nobody knows. So we didn't have appointments. We just went to the doctor's office and we waited in the waiting room. And whoever was there ahead of us, they got seen first. And we didn't resent it because we expected to wait for our turn because we knew when we got in, we would get a fair amount of time. And we paid a fair fee for a fair service. And it was a system that worked very well. Physicians were not filthy rich. They were comfortable. They usually had their office in their home. They usually had a nice home, but they were not millionaires. And physicians spent time, however much time you needed, that's how much time the doctor spent, because there was no schedule he had to follow. And he knew you. And if you were too sick to sit in the waiting room, he made house calls. And if you got to the waiting room and it was packed solid, you could say, well, maybe I don't really feel that sick at all, and go home and, and let yourself heal. So we had a system that worked really well. And physicians were comfortable. They knew their patients, they cared about their patients, patients felt cared about, and since 90% of what ails us is going to get better by itself anyhow, that what you need probably more than anything else is a little comfort advice, how to make yourself comfortable while you heal, then, then it was a system that wasn't broken. Mm -hmm. So how did it get broken? Well, the way it got broken, because I was in practice back, I got my MD in, in 1970, so I was a cardiologist by the mid uh, 70s, and I was in practice then. And it was at a time when insurance companies wanted to make more money. Now, can we really blame insurance companies? I mean, they don't really claim to like us. They don't really claim to care about us. They claim to make money. Insurance companies want to make money. <laughs> and so they decided that in, in addition to covering anything that was done in the hospital, which we always had Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, so if we had to go in the hospital, that was expensive and then that was covered. They decided they wanted the office visit covered. And so they went to physicians and they said, how about we, we reimburse you directly so that you don't have to collect the money from the patient? And physicians, of course, initially said, well, no, it's not a problem. But the insurance company said, well, but if we pay you directly, you know, then you don't have to hassle patients. And, you know, as, as old-fashioned physicians did, suppose you fell on hard times, they gave you a break, or you bartered, or you paid right. over time. And the insurance company said, you don't have any of that hassle, we'll just pay you directly what, what your fee is. Well, I was amazed, physicians went for it. And so they decided to, to do that. Well, since physicians were never poor to begin with, I was surprised that they were tempted by money. But what happened was, as soon as the insurance company was paying, what physicians did was they raised their fees. And because the insurance company wanted all physicians contracted, they paid you what you asked for. I was in practice back then. And physicians compared how much they charged. They said, oh, I raised my fees. And the other one said, well, we'll raise mine too. And so what the insurance company did was they passed what they paid to you on to the patient. And that was before employers paid for the insurance. So you paid your own premium. So physicians paid doctors whatever they asked, and then they passed that on to the patient. So the patient's now paying more of a premium, so what does the patient want? They want more. So mm -hmm. they say, doctors, I want more, I want this, I want this, I want this. Physicians said, fine. The more I do, the more I get paid. So physicians not only raised their fees, they started doing procedures in the office that were previously only done in hospitals. They bought the equipment, they hired the, the specialized technicians, because if you own the equipment and pay the technicians, you can charge more than if you just interpret the study. Mm. So this little round robin went on that physicians did more procedures, they raised their fees, insurance companies passed it on to the patient, patients wanted more, and this went on until all physicians were contracted with insurance companies. At that point, the insurance company had all the power. So they said to patients, you're not gonna get so much coverage, you're gonna have co-pays, you're gonna have deductibles.
Mm. And patients were stuck. What could they do? They said to physicians, we're not going to pay you so much for each visit or for each procedure. So physicians got huffy. They said, well, then we'll just take our business elsewhere. And so the insurance company said, that's fine, but 40% of your practice is covered by us. So there goes 40% of your practice. At that point, physicians realized they were had, and they've not been able to step out of, of that dilemma. So today, insurance companies, since the 80s, insurance companies have been reducing and reducing and reducing and reducing mm -hmm. the reimbursement. Now, and I'm in solo practice, so I know what it's like to run a business. I mean, I have rent, I have salaries, I have office supplies. They all go up every year. But if you're, if, if you're contracted with an insurance company, your reimbursement comes down. So this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. So what do physicians do? Now, I don't participate with insurance companies at all. I do fee-for-service, so I don't have this issue. But what do doctors do if they are contracted with insurance companies? As their expenses go up and their reimbursement comes down, they have to find a way to, to, to make the bottom line. So they spend less time and less and less and less time. So we now average six minutes per doctor visit. Wow. Now, six minutes isn't enough time to say hello and goodbye properly, I don't think. <laughs> so you have your six-minute visit. Now, you're going to show up, you have a symptom. You don't have a disease yet. So the doctor was going to write you a prescription to get rid of the symptom, and it's going to order the test, and out you go. So let's, go, let's say you get the prescription filled, you take the drug, and it doesn't help. You still have the symptom. You get your test done. You go back to see the doctor. You say, I still have those symptoms. And he looks at your tests and he goes, well, your tests are all normal, so don't worry about it. And here's another prescription, see if we can get rid of the symptoms. Well, now you go and you get the other drug, and that doesn't get rid of the symptoms. So now you go back again. How many times do you think you dare go back, mm -hmm. tell the doctor that you're not any better? And he keeps telling me your tests are all, all normal. Then pretty soon it gets to be, maybe you need a tranquilizer. Maybe you need a psychiatrist. Maybe you need to get a life. Maybe you need to get out of my office. Physicians don't want you to come back when they can't tell you the answer. Mm -hmm. And so what happens if you don't have a disease is you're not going to get treated. So there is no preventative care in this country. There's no, the physicians don't know any way to even evaluate you when you have a symptom but you don't have a disease. Now, in fact, there are ways, but that requires that you'd know functional medicine that you understand how the body functions. Right. Because you could actually order a test to see, measure the nutrient level in your cells. But most conventional physicians don't know about this test. Mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't know how to evaluate um, whether you're absorbing your nutrients. You know, I oftentimes think when I see patients with, with chronic disease, the approach I take is pretty much always the same. I look to see how they're eating. If they look like they're getting a reasonably healthy diet in, um, what I oftentimes will do is put them on an allergy elimination diet, where essentially I'm removing all the things that, that people tend to react to. Now, why would I do this? I mean, you know, whether it's heart disease or arthritis or cancer, why would I take a similar approach? Because what happens with, with our assimilation of nutrients is that in your GI tract, it's sort of like a little sieve. And the openings aren't very big. It's like a little tea strainer. So you can't get very large molecules absorbed. But, and that means that you wouldn't get anything bigger than an amino acid. You wouldn't right. get a whole protein in. You, know, you get glucose in, you get fatty acids in, you get amino acids, but you don't get bigger compounds in. But let's say like you're the average American and you take aspirin or you take ibuprofen or Motrin or something for pain. Um, what happens is that you open the size of the sieves, the sieve openings. Now all of a sudden, and it isn't just those drugs, any number of drugs can cause that. Um, any number of foods that we eat can cause that. And what it does is it increases the intestinal permeability so that now you're absorbing larger proteins than you should. Right. Well, what will your body think if a large protein gets in? It's going to think it's a foreign invader. It's not supposed to be there. Just as we talked about in the past with plaque, that it knows you're not supposed to have lipids in the wall, and right. so it sets up inflammation. If you absorb proteins into your GI tract that are too big, it thinks it's a foreign invader. So now it forms antibodies to it. 
If those proteins happen to be similar to some proteins in your body, you now attack your own body. And you know, something like rheumatoid arthritis, which is a very disfiguring, serious disease, which are treated with god-awful drugs. Mm -hmm. In those patients, if you eliminate something like nightshade, the vegetables, potato, tomato, um, eggplant, that the, the that's a, it's a food allergy disease. And if you eliminate those so that they don't have this leaky gut and they're not forming antibodies to these foods, that then attack the joints, right. the disease goes away. So I always think that if you're going to approach somebody with chronic disease, it's a really a, a pretty standard approach. You've got to look at your GI tract, which of course is a huge surface area where you're introducing the foreign world. You, know, right. you, you have as much surface area as a football field right. that is being exposed to food, beverages. And so if you, I usually take the approach of putting them on an allergy elimination diet so I remove anything that they're currently reacting to. The idea is to get rid of inflammation. Then I usually look to see do their cells have enough nutrients. In other words, if they're not getting nutrients in, maybe they need the nutrients. I'm not a big believer in just loading people up with supplements and selling them supplements because I mean, supplement companies, just like pharmaceutical industry, yeah. they want to make money. Yeah. And if you ever read supplements, you know, you read about what it does and you think, oh, my God, I've got to have that. You put it on your shopping list. But then the next one you read and you go, oh, I need that too. And you're <laughs> never sure how you got this far without all of these. <laughs> and the first thing you know is you're buying every supplement. Well, they want you to want to buy their supplements. Right. But we don't need that. We have a remarkable body yeah. that doesn't necessarily need that much input. But I always look to see, are there nutrients that they need? And if there are, I, I give them those. And then I also give them the healthy bacteria that our bowel needs. It isn't just that it prevents overgrowth of bad things, but it also supports our immune system. Right. You know? yeah, and somehow nobody ever talks about your GI tract as having its own immune system, but mm -hmm. it has a huge immune system. In fact, it has a great nerve, nervous system. You know the serotonin that people talk about for depression? 80% of your serotonin is in your GI tract. It's mm -hmm. not in your brain. Mm -hmm. So our GI tracts are very, very important. And giving the patients the probiotics, the healthy bacteria that they need, um, allows the immune system to start functioning properly. Then once you've checked to see they're getting in the, the nutrients, you're getting rid of, you're removing the things that they're reacting to, you're giving them the nutrients they don't have. You're giving them the healthy bacteria that are going to make the GI tract function well and the immune system well. And then, at that point, you can then help them to heal their GI tract. And then you can add, start adding back the foods that you removed. Right. And what you find is that you can add back most foods mm -hmm. once the GI tract heals. But if you never take this approach, and this is an approach that's never taken, right. but I would venture to say with almost without exception, every single chronic disease known to man, you could take this approach and probably cure most people. And so your office visits are much longer than six <laughs> minutes, I assume. <laughs> I do two hours with the initial visit, and the follow-ups are in, uh, 45 minutes to an hour. And, and I, I do fee-for-service. If the patients have insurance that will reimburse them, we fill out the insurance forms for them uh, so they can get reimbursed. Now, Medicare will not reimburse them. Right. And HMOs will not reimburse them. Kind of sad commentary. So what Dr. Soli has explained to us today is that the American medical care has not a very caring system at all. That on the average a doctor will spend s six minutes, maybe ten, with you. And uh, I would say that sounds like it's due to the fact that they're actually regulated. They allow themselves to be regulated and, and run by the insurance companies dictations. Yeah. Yeah. And so what she's explained to us is that what used to be medical care where you'd go into a physician's office and the physician would probably spend six or ten minutes just asking you how your, how your husband is and how your dog is <laughs> and you know how you like your new car um, and then take care of you. We've really drawn, we've really gotten so far away from that that um, the American medical care system doesn't work on taking care of the patient or even 
addressing the physiology and nutritional aspect of the patient that the American medical care is now more based on diagnostics and drug mm -hmm. prescriptions. Yeah. Drugs and procedures. Right. You know, the AMA, in its infinite wisdom, has publicly announced that physicians are the third leading cause of death in this country. Wow. The AMA has... The AMA. Been. It's published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and um, they say physicians are the third leading cause of death because they, they order procedures or do procedures and prescribe drugs. And, you know, if you ever look to see just how many deaths occur as a result of drugs mm -hmm. in this country, it's absolutely phenomenal. I always think it's amazing that you're always hearing about the dangers of alternative medicine, of supplements. Right. And do you know anybody who's ever died of a supplement problem? Right. Do you know anybody who's been harmed by a drug? Right. Yeah. yeah. That the truth point. is that, you know, prescription medications, taken exactly as prescribed, not accidental overdose, not accidentally taking the wrong drug, not, you know, pharmacists couldn't read the doctor's writing or whatever. It's medication taken exactly as a physician prescribes. is actually the fourth leading cause of death all by itself. I would like to thank you for joining us on HealthWise Alternatives. I hope that today's interview with Dr. Christine Soley has been eye-opening and will be an encouragement to you to listen to our future shows on holistic natural medicine. Thank you. This season on HealthWise Alternatives, we will be interviewing holistic medical doctors, practitioners, and counselors who will explain natural medicine approaches to health and disease. HealthWise Alternatives is created by The Woman in You and Take One Films. Check our website, thewomaninyou.info, for scheduling information or contact your local cable access.